I got the recording going. I've got the Facebook going. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Ham Radio Now, the most important amateur radio program on the internet. Wouldn't wouldn't you agree? I would agree. <laughs> and and also, I'd tell everyone to put some money in the picky. Well, we'll we'll, we'll get there in just seconds. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, this is episode three hundred eighty-seven. Bruce Perrins, K six BP. I just can gonna name it after you <laughs> that that will sell the show People, it's it's uh bruce does florida <laughs> the, the bruce Perrins florida tour yeah all right and i am uh gary pierce kn4aq ham radio now is brought to you by you if you enjoy the program bruce, bruce is going to do my commercial oh okay so uh i have a piggy here and uh I, I the last time I put anything in this picky, it was a thousand dollars. This oh, should yeah. inspire some of you. <laughs> yeah, and um, it is important that news of amateur radio be brought to you amateurs. And this is a show on which, as you can see, anyone can participate. <laughs> and when there's yeah, we news, have no standards. <laughs> <laughs> and when there is news, Gary's going to bring it to you. So. Put some money in the piggy. Yeah. And his, his name it, is Arvin, by the way. Yes. And if everybody put some money in there, um, we would be able to have this show without Gary standing on the corner saying, need money to make ham radio <laughs> video. Yeah. So you probably haven't heard that I am actually giving up ham radio now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm turning it over to my uh, my uh, uh, guest host, guest host, my my uh, co-host, uh, David um, Goldenberg, W zero D H G, who lives in Los Angeles, just just down the road from you. Uh, you know, couple, only four hundred miles. miles. Yeah, so you can stop by his studio live and in person. Okay. And, uh, you see the guy who was sitting here earlier today? No, he, he um, he's never been to the East Coast Ham Fest. He's never even been to Dayton. So. Oh, okay. I, I may still do the Ham Fest. I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I'm certainly getting energized about, about ham, ham Fest participation, but it's going to dissipate. i got other stuff to do. I want to do a, you know, kind of a liberal-oriented talk show back in Raleigh, so that'll make you happy. Okay. That sounds. We certainly could use some liberal oriented. Yeah, I know. And and now we're gonna both get email from you know keep the politics out of ham radio. You know, it's funny. I I live in Berkeley, and now Berkeley every couple of months has the Village Idiots World Conference. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll say nothing more it's, about. And it's self named, I imagine. They decided <laughs> that's what they wanted to call it. All right. So, All right, so uh, what, what I was going to say is that um, as far as this show is, goes, this is probably the last you're going to see or hear from me. Uh, I'll turn the camera on Bruce, and he can go for an hour. Oh, okay. So uh, lots of fun stuff going on. And uh, first of all, I had planned for probably a year to come down on the 5th. Okay, not a clue what would be happening, but maybe a little of a hope, because I think it was two years ago, I came down and saw the Discover mission launched on SpaceX, and that was um, sort of disappointing and, and still fun, because I had paid $50 to be on this gantry at NASA and went and stood on the gantry in the cold wind for two hours and then they scrubbed the launch. Yeah, it's, and like, the, it's always a, uh, a crapshoot first going thing, to launch. First thing that you need to know about launches is that you will only see one for every three that you go to because they scrub and the alternative is having more rockets blow up. So we're glad that they scrub. And so... Um, at the Discover launch, I was actually, because it was such a clear sky, after they closed the gantry the next day, Delaware North, which runs all the tours at Kennedy Space Center, in their wisdom decided not to open any viewing spots on the base. So I ended up watching from Jetty Park. But it was so beautifully clear that I saw the Falcon 9 and the stage separation and the fairings come off. and. You're looking directly into space when that happens. It's already getting to orbit. It's at least 40 miles up. And you're still just looking at it with the... Did you bring any kind of uh, optics? Well, or well that, time, that time was naked eye. So this time, 
I brought a space binocular set. So it's a larger than normal set of binoculars. It and looks a like a, a, geek, a geek set of binoculars. Yeah, and a tripod and a pantogram. So with the pantogram, the binoculars go up and down so that you can let short people look. <laughs> and um, so anyway... Um, went to the feel the heat area and I think the tickets for this were available for about an hour and they were $195 and at least this time Delaware North says and if it scrubs we'll let you in the next time so nice of them yeah really I might not have been in Florida by then but so um it's at the Saturn V Center, and they give us a nice buffet and soda all day, which was very nice standing in the Florida heat. And uh, so this time wasn't in the winter time. Well, this is this was just early last week. Last yeah, weekend. yeah, and this was Tuesday, and so um, the Falcon finally launched about four o'clock, just sort of getting to the close of the window, and I did follow it in the binoculars all the way up to stage separation saw the rocket separate saw three separate rockets in the air, engines still burning and then followed two of them down even after they had closed off the engines, I could still see them in the binoculars finally lost them in a cloud I was watching the video of that yesterday and um, while the video was impressive, what really set me off was the crowd just going nuts. Everybody was going nuts. I saw the SpaceX video afterwards, and people at SpaceX were totally out of their <laughs> minds. And, so, and Elon Musk wrote on Twitter something like, I'm high on balls, <laughs> which I still don't understand what that means. Doesn't matter. And so... Because yeah. we, um, we all remember you know, the, the, the Apollo 13 movie uh, when, when they were doing the press conference and they cut it off because, you know... <gasps> You know, space stopped being a thing back then. So it's a thing again. It is a thing, and, and there's this big feeling of hope with the Falcon, and maybe we'll see the same thing with Blue Origin once they have an orbital rocket. Because right now they just have a, a sounding rocket. It goes up and comes back down. And, um, you know, I've been waiting for this for 50 years. My dad worked on the lunar module, and we were going to the moon, and then things sort of just went poof. Your dad worked on the lunar module? Yeah, he worked for Grumman. What, did he, what part did he work on? Um, he worked on uh, design of one of the antennas on the top of the lunar module. And I was going to make a joke and ask if he was a Wallowitz and he built the lunar toilet, but they didn't, they didn't have a toilet. <laughs> he, no, he wasn't. And... Um, no, they had very primitive arrangements, especially on the lunar module. Yeah. And so, I believe it's uh, pee in your pants. It's pretty the- much. And, and so, um, and he made the system for calibrating the landing struts. So the landing struts had to deform just the right amount so that you did not crash and also so that you came down level because the uh, bottom of the lunar module was the launch pad for the top. So that only could be uh, tilted a little bit. Um, So he worked on that, and he was in it. There was no advance crew there to level things out with. That's correct. And um, he was in environmental testing. So he did a lot of putting space things in vacuum chambers and vibrating. Did you get to uh, you know take you know take your kid to work day and go see what he did? Never there. I, you know, maybe that would work today, but not back then. Um, Did he inspire you? We got you? to air shows. Did he inspire you? I mean, Certainly. I, I, I Certainly. I don't know what your relationship is with your dad. But, but, well, you know, he's whether. passed away now. Yeah. But yeah, he very definitely inspired me. And uh, he was around for when I started in computer graphics. And I actually got to give him tours, so that was pretty <laughs> cool. At the place I worked in New York, it was sort of the predecessor of Pixar and so anyway with the Falcon so the the uh, two burns for the two boosters start they're decelerating from hypersonic to subsonic 
And so you see him like 45 degrees up in the air. And then I followed them again with the monoculars down to the ground. And just seeing those things, naked eye, they're landing together. Now, how that far away really from impressive. the launch pad was the landing pad? Uh, well, where I was, I was 3.9 miles from the launch pad, which is probably as close as you want to get. And uh, I was Because it, prob- it could be a bomb. Yeah, you know, this one wasn't so bad because it didn't have anything that had hydrazine in it. The, the most dangerous thing on the SpaceX rocket is the um, hydrazine in the satellite, if the satellite has hydrazine fuel, and then they have uh, pyrophoric igniters, but not very much of them. You know, just the fuel is not, not going to reach you four miles away. Um, so uh, I think we were about 10 miles from the landing site, but we could very clearly see both rockets. And then Thursday, uh, and I believe it's only Thursdays at uh, Kennedy Space Center, there is an old space tour and um, they actually have extra procedures because it goes on to the military base. And so I signed up for the Old Space Tour months before. And so there they go right down by the landing zone. And there's a place where the woods are all cut down and you can see from the road into the landing zone. And so Thursday, one of the Falcons was still standing covered with soot. (laughs) Wow. And we just got this great view of it. So um, I had heard about the launch course and, and people talking about it, but I hadn't watched it live until yesterday. I watched the, some of the video. What I didn't realize is that the, the that the boosters landed on pads, dead in the center. And I heard that they that they, they came down like synchronized swimmers at the same time. But I didn't realize they were that close together, and and they they hit dead center. I mean, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Um, SpaceX has gotten really good at the guidance part. They actually had to change the settings on the radar because when you land on concrete, the reflection comes from the rebar, which is actually at some depth into the concrete. So the radar had to give a different distance than it did on the ship, which is steel right on the top. Uh, and they actually landed harder on the concrete than the ship until they figured that out. <laughs> it, took a, it took a while to figure it out. Um, I guess I guess have, it's not obvious. Well, I mean, you saw in the video the last time I was on your show, all of yeah. the times that SpaceX blew up a rocket. Yeah. By the way, I want to thank you for that. I got it. Not a takedown notice. I got monetized. Oh so. no. <laughs> You know, SpaceX said all their stuff was public domain. Well, it might have been the music. I don't know. But okay. But somehow the video got monetized, which is fine. That's a nice way to do it. So that the video stays up. People can watch it. And for all the folks that, that watched it, I mean, they monetized it after the, the, big, you know, the big surge. In the first couple of days, most people watch it. And then, like, the third day, they caught on. So they, they have, I, I estimate that they have made about nine and a half cents off of watching that, you know, people watching that video from them monetizing it. So... Remind good, me, good I owe you a quarter. <laughs> well, I didn't have to pay it. You know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so everything you, so you got, came out right. So you, so you got to see the uh, the booster rocket all covered in soot. It wasn't still steaming or anything, I don't suppose. No, and, and they guide it from the top. So they were taking the first one down, and, and I guess because they didn't have two trucks to haul them out of there. <laughs> They guide that one so in case a big wind came up, it wouldn't go over. But they're very bottom heavy. They're empty and all the way to in the engines. Um, so that was great to see. And I've never gone to a launch where everything is worked out as well as it has this time. And this is probably about the 10th launch attempt that I've, you know, 10th launch. So, you so a one, one out of three, you've seen a few other launches. Yeah. And, and I usually go to Vandenberg, because I live in California. Vandenberg is about a five-hour drive from Berkeley. So it's not a decision you make lightly, but I've done it a few times now. So um, I was at a Subway having lunch a couple months ago, uh-huh. and there was a convention at the hotel across the street, the Flat Earth Society. Uh-huh. And... Uh, 
and this is not the joke flat earth. These are the serious flat earthers. And the and and s people came across the street to the restaurant zone that I was in, accosting people with flat earth stuff. And I, I had an advantage over them. I, I, I could ask questions about RF. Um, and you could ask, you could say, well, you know, I've seen these things go up into space. <laughs> I think I think there's space, <laughs> and I think the Earth is round. But I could I could talk to him about how uh, you know, why doesn't the FM station here on the 2,000 foot tower with 100,000 watts why does it fade out 70 miles away? And they could not answer that question. Mm -hmm. It's an oh, interference or something. Yeah. So 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 so. To get serious about that, I was contacted by a guy who makes telescope tracking software, essentially, so that you can watch a launch. And he had put up a video, and he start, get, started getting harassed by flat earthers, and yeah. uh, who said, oh, you, you stole the software from your work or something. And um, so, you know, I'm wondering now if I should get the guy a lawyer. It's, they can get serious and nasty. Yeah, they, they are true believers. Yeah, and so, you, meanwhile, you know, I've just been to something where I, I watched it with two eyes and a piece of glass <laughs> go into space. Yeah, they got answers for most things, but they didn't, yeah. they didn't have an answer for the RF. You're saying something about uh, some open source stuff up on, on the uh, Oh, okay, so the Falcon has open source. Um, First of all, they have the USRP, the Universal Software per uh, Radio Peripheral, which is a software-defined radio board ba made by Edis Research, Matt Edis. Yep, a, and, a tapper stalwart. Yes, and um, I actually ran into one of the SpaceX board members waiting for the flight down here and said, you know, you know you've opened hardware, and he knew all about it, and he said... We save two hundred thousand dollars on space radio every time we use that. Now, in a Falcon Nine Heavy, that's probably about twenty space radios. So that is not an insignificant amount, which they save by using uh, open hardware, SDR, some open source software to do the radio, rather than buy the nifty dedicated space radio, which costs you know very much money. Um, it probably doesn't work as well. Yes, and people have told me that they've put the USRP specifically in sounding rockets that hit 20 Gs, and that it takes <laughs> it. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and they can make it do almost whatever they want, because that's what it's for. Yeah, that's the point. Obviously, SpaceX writes lots of custom software, and... Um, they would rather program it than not be able to program it and be on the phone all the time with the manufacturer who might not be that good at listening. And that's also their style. They'd rather make a screw by themselves than buy it in a lot of cases. And, and they've shown a savings by doing so. Um, so they also have Linux on the rocket and they have Linux in the control center. Um, so you won't see the blue screen of death. And <laughs> especially um, these days. You know, I'm not saying it doesn't ever crash, but they've you, got you, it in situations where they know it. You, you can launch your rocket in a couple of minutes, but please don't shut down your computer. We're installing uh, the, the uh, fall creators update right now. Right, right. And um, so they also... Um, and, and I apologize because right now your audio and video are going through a Windows computer. I'm sorry. We'll I didn't, didn't mean that to happen you, to you. You know, sometimes my wife runs Windows on her computer and I don't go through ritual purification <laughs> before I come home. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be cool with that. And so... Um, they also have a source code control system that's open source that they use for their own development. And I've forgotten its name, but they did a talk about it, and I believe the talk is on YouTube. And um, so lots of open source in there, and, and they know they can use it, it's good, and they don't have to write it, which is what it means for SpaceX. SpaceX is looking to make space flight affordable and I think we just saw a really great advance because that Falcon 9 Heavy can lift quite a lot 
and actually only costs, I think, about $35 million more than the plain old Falcon 9. Now, those boosters had already been in space before, right? The two they, side they were, boosters. They were retreads. The two side boosters were retreads. They were also block twos. So they weren't going to get reused too many times. Okay, the, the new ones are block fives, and block fives are supposed to be able to be reused many yeah. times. And they were trying to catch the main, the main booster on a... Uh, platform in the ocean, and that one didn't work. Well, what happened was they ran out of the pyrophoric igniter. This is two chemicals called TEA and TEB, and I know TEB is tetraethyl borate. I forgot what the other one is. And so uh, these are pyrophoric, so they will burst into flame if they contact oxygen, just, just contact the air. They use that instead of a spark. It's a more reliable So that's the light. igniter. Yeah. And let, let in a little air. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, let out this chemical into the combustion chamber, and there is air or liquid oxygen there. And so um, they ran out for the very final landing burn, and this was a, a high-thrust landing burn. They usually land on one engine, but because this had gone farther and faster than any SpaceX rocket ever had before, the middle booster burned for 35 seconds longer. Um, this was quite far down range and they had to slow it down more and they ran out of the igniter chemical so one out of three engines lit and the way it comes down is it's actually aimed to the side of the ship and then it swerves to the top of the ship during the final burn. And that's so that if the final burn fails, that it won't just put a hole in the middle of the barge, and which they have anyway. And um, <laughs> so this thing comes down at 300 miles an hour, a scant 100 feet from the barge. Shrapnel peppers the barge and takes out two of these thrusters. It was that, unmanned, right? Yeah. It's, uh, the, there are people in a ship that are miles away. And... Um, so it takes out two of these huge thrusters that station keep the barge within 10 feet of the position. And uh, I have heard before that uh, a hit on that barge has cost them $2 million to fix. So they probably had that sort of hit again this time. Okay, so it, it wasn't like it was lost by miles. It was, it was, it was there. It just couldn't accomplish the landing. It, it was like if they had a couple more ounces of that chemical, <laughs> they would have landed. Yeah. And so obviously... Nobody, nobody's, nobody's blaming them right at this point. Nobody. No, obviously. And, and they'll make that tank a little bigger. They don't want to pick up anything that they don't have to because on a rocket, you know, to get one ounce into space takes you 10 gallons of fuel or something. So... Um, you know, they got really close on that final goal. So, so all the astronauts do Weight Watchers before they uh, go into space. Well, you know, like the Mercury 7, they weren't allowed to be more than six feet tall. Yeah. And so, you know, they're all kind of small guys. I, I did meet Buzz Aldrin. And so um, we, we've seen some really interesting things here. First of all, think of King Tut and the pyramids. Okay, Tut and Common did not make a more astonishing or enduring memorial to himself than Elon Musk has just made with his car in the orbit. <laughs> and um, that, that car, you know, minus a few holes, might be there a hundred million years from now if someone doesn't go out and get it before then. And also, if we're not careful, that might not be the memorial to Elon. That might be the memorial to the whole human race. So Now, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, we just have to make some mistakes with North Korea and China and stuff oh, like so, that. Oh, so it, it, it could endure long past... That's correct. Us. us Pe uh, people could ug come. Ugly bags of mostly water. That's correct. Uh, you know, aliens could come long from now, and what they find of the human race will be that car. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's not do that. Um, 
Oh, so let's talk about uh, HT of the future. Yeah, so I was going to ask you about that. Uh, a couple of Dayton's ago, um, you guys uh, made a, 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 um, a, a pretty good uh, mea culpa or uh, you know, explanation. We tried and we couldn't quite get there. And um, it was harder than you thought. Well, what was... I guess for the harder than we thought. For, and the, it, for it, the folks that are wondering, what we're talking about you, you, you had talked about building a, uh, a radio that would um, a software-defined VHF UHF radio that would do any mode, but particularly designed for for um, a, a VHF version of FreeDV or Codec Two based digital. But it, it would do anything else you put a codec in for. Yeah, and, and you were trying to make a mobile radio out of that, and um, turned out well. You explain it. Okay, so. Um, we're two guys. We're essentially doing this on pocket change. And uh, we also have a lot to learn. And so what happened was there was more noise in that system than we expected there to be. And that has to do with the digital and the analog being sort of close together and also other noise sources. Uh, there are oscillators, there are regulators, everyone makes noise. So we ended up with the radio that was noisier than we wanted. And the other thing that was happening is other people were making SDR boards. And because maybe they had a better budget, they had engineers who maybe had a little more experience than us, I think they've done a better job. So what I plan to bring to Dayton is a demo based on the Lime Micro. And Lime Micro is an SDR. They have uh, a handheld size now, but they formerly had a card that wasn't too big. And um, you really just have to add on to it pre-amplifiers and amplifiers rather than make the entire SDR. And the SDR board itself is about $100. Okay, so we have that part now. And Chris and I don't have to make that. What we now have to make is pre-amplifiers and amplifiers, which is much much more bounded thing. So I will come to the show probably with some blocks hooked up together, um, but we'll show everything uh, that's in an operating way. Yeah, your partner um, is Chris Testa. Yeah. Um, KB2... KD2BMH, I think. Yeah. And so, but I did notice that there are other people who are making things that kind of look like what I was talking about. So... This is being sold by uh, our finder. Okay. Yep, they're here at the Hamfest. Yes, and um, so the, this is an essentially an Android phone. Well, it's an Android phone, as you can see the Android uh, background here. This is Android six, and um, it's got a DMR and FMHT in it. So the deal is that this is not the radio that we were talking about from an internal perspective because we want to make an SDR and we can do better things with an SDR. So it is the user interface that we were talking about. Okay, so there's your Android right on on the front of your HT. Now, now cell phones, Android phones, um, they are uh, not SDRs yet or not SDRs ever. Well, cell phones actually are SDRs, but they're not SDRs that we can open the hood of. Ah. And um, so this particular radio that is in... So this device that our finder is selling, it actually comes from a Chinese company called Runbo. And uh, you can buy it directly from them without the R, R finder software on it. Uh, what our finder is adding is the entire repeater book in the HT and then it's got the GPS built in so it just tells you all of the closest repeaters to where you are and right now it does it using the internet but they're going to change that so that the whole database is in the HT um, so from a user interface perspective they've achieved what I wanted to do not yet from an RF perspective now, I can put free DV on that walkie-talkie, 
using the modem that we have for analog walkie-talkie. So it's the same modem we'd use for a walkie-talkie that does DMR, D-Star, etc. They actually use an analog modulator rather than an SDR. And that works fine. It works as good as D-Star and DMR, and it's all open source. But if we use an SDR, we have 8 to 10 dB improvement in signal and noise. Yeah, that was your talk um, back at the uh, DCC. Yeah. How, how if you, what everybody's doing for digital right now is forcing it through an analog window, which makes it worse. Yeah. I was paying attention. That's, that's absolutely right. And uh, it's nice that since you have to be in the room anyway, you're listening. <laughs> and I, I don't catch things on the first pass. It's when I edit things together that I understand. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, yes, you have to tell me something ten times sometimes. Yeah. So, um, it's a great thing about the recordings. Anyway, uh, we, so we want to get an SDR in there. And, and the guy from R Finder, he agrees with with us. He says in two years, you know, maybe that company or some other one will have an SDR in that kind of box. Yeah, that is, I believe, uh, Bob Greenberg, uh, W2CYK, if I've got his call sign right, the R Finder guy. Uh, he may not be the engineer that you're working with, though. Yeah, okay. He just runs the company. Okay. And um, so, anyway, uh, they're charging somewhere north of $700 for that. So, not like your $25 bow thing, but it's kind of fun. And uh, it's also a phone, uh, but it's interesting. Chinese telephones don't have all the bands that real United States phones do. So it works better on ATT. It doesn't work on T-Mobile because T-Mobile uses different bands. So, you know, they say 4G, but 4G doesn't always mean the same thing. There's, there's a little cell phone spectrum all over the place, isn't there? Yeah. And, and maybe that's much. not efficient, but yeah. I don't know. I and mean, they got 700 megahertz, 800 megahertz, 2 gig or so, 5 gig. And, uh, and then the new stuff is going to be, what, 60 gigahertz and well, go, and go know, 100 feet? It would be feet. nice to, to get them up into the terahertz because we actually have room there. <laughs> uh, and it would be nice to get hams doing something up there, too. You know, even if it's one or two, I'd like to see it. They, um, they make the radios, we'll, we will modify them. Yeah. So, um, oh, and I, I wanted to talk about my second QTH. Um, so I, a while ago, did, this is sort of something that I wouldn't recommend to everyone else because you can get ripped off, but I bought land on eBay. And I don't buy anything on eBay. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared to go to eBay. So I bought 10 acres in McDowell, California, the last, last 10 acres of affordable land in California for $4,500. What part of the state is that? It's about 45 minutes south of Klamath Falls. Uh, so it's far northern California. And California's so, a big state. There's a lot of empty in California. Yeah, it's not all so, LA and San Francisco. So it's actually a couple hours drive to Redding. Redding is, is south of it. And um, so I, I bought this uh, 10 acres of farmland, sight unseen, on a dirt road, a mile and a half from AC Power. So, <laughs> so I finally get there pulling my trailer on the dirt road um, for fuel day. And um, get there, set up my antenna, and the first thing I find out is that being a mile and a half from AC Power does not mean you're RF quiet anymore. <laughs> Because everyone around you has solar power and they're oh, they're so, they're terrible. Yeah, the solar power controllers are really bad. So, so I have to make friends with my neighbors and put chokes on their wires. And but they're actually happy to have me because I don't grow pot. <laughs> and apparently, everyone else who was coming in was doing it to grow pot. Um, so the second thing, okay, so I've spent. $4,500 for this land. So really cheap. So I'm walking around on the land and I see a hole in the ground. It's, you know, could be an animal den or something. 
and I get closer, and there's cold air blowing out of the hole like Uh-oh. an air conditioner. <laughs> what does that mean? It means it's a cave. So I have a cave on my own land. I have not gotten it. A cave with two entrances. Well, usually there's a lot of small ones maybe in a big one. Maybe the the air's got to move through to become a Yeah. Uh, And where I am is uh, peppered with lava tubes. So it's a lava tube cave. And uh, I'm, the next time I come down there, I'm going to bring a camera on a long pole and, you know, stick it in there and see if there's anything dangerous. Lava, a lava tube is a cave that is made from flowing lava <clears throat> from a volcano, and then the lava flows out, leaving a hole. And, uh, and leaving the tube. Yeah, it's like makes, a straw. Yeah. And... Um, <clears throat> So uh, there are a whole bunch. There are ones that are open for tourists up in that neighborhood. And so I happened to to purchase one totally unknowingly. And um, so the other thing I'm going to bring next time is an infrared camera. And I think, especially at night, that I might be able to find the other cave entrances that way. Um, So that would be fun. It it may be big enough to actually walk, walk or crawl through. It may not. Yeah, maybe stable. It may not. Maybe my death if I go in there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I had a great tour uh, of a lava tube in um, Hawaii. Uh huh. I've been LA. in that one. Yeah. I think. Well, you've been in the in the, uh, what the the uh, the whole Hawaii is called the Thurston lava tube. It was on the Big Island, I believe. Yeah. 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 Just out, outside of um, the, the the Kilauea volcanoes. Uh huh. But we took a private tour to a, to a lava tube that's uh, far more distant in out in the woods you, you'd never find it ah and um it, and it, it it did not have a floor you could walk along you had to pick your way through it you know if you look at on tv all the caves have studio floors on them you know, they're, they're flat that's not the way real caves are yeah so anyway i i, I guess i didn't know that there were lava tubes in california or anywhere stateside that, well you know, mount shasta is a volcano yeah and um, so we will um, investigate that. And um, the other question is, are there bats in it? And, you know, if there are bats, I don't want to disturb them. Yeah, so, bats are good, but... Yeah, that'll be something that I, I want to take a look at. But, you but know, just sit there at the entrance at, at night and see if that, you know, like, like in Austin. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, I was there for Tapper and saw all the bats come out of the bridge. That was really impressive. Um, So um, that was fun. And then ARL politics. So (laughs) should we start? And now for something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. So so should we start with uh, the whole thing, I guess? Yeah. Well, you got ARL badges all over the place, so I'm not sure where you come down on things. So here we are. Oh, I should show the audience this. This is obviously not an official ARL badge. Oh, loyal opposition. I right. See. Okay, but it's it's in the same style as your director badges. So oh, yes, it is. It's sort of a joke that's aimed at my director, and uh, who is now Jim Teamstra. He was Bob Valio, the guy who started World War III, but uh, Bob is now second vice president of the ARL. And uh, we talked, I guess, about how Bob started World War III, didn't we? Not ringing the bell. Oh, okay. Bob Valio went to an island in the South China Sea and ran a de-expedition from it. And there's a very famous picture of Bob on this island that has indeed been used in a number of step IR ads in QSD. Um, Where it's just this American guy on this rock that's 10 feet square with a generator and and a uh, radio and a step IR vertical. And, you know, he's got his counterpoise in the water. And my theory is that the Chinese saw this picture and that they said, well, if an American can come to our island (laughs) and run a base with a two-way radio with international range, we should take this seriously. So the Chinese came and built an airport. Now, was this one of those disputed islands? That, yeah, cause, yeah. Cause you it, know, the Philippines did, say it's yeah. theirs, and China says it's theirs. Yeah, so for DXCC credit, he had to have official 
standing with somebody. I suppose he could have gotten that from China, but well, obviously didn't. I don't know if it if this was Spratly or just which one. It yeah. Was. But okay. So. Um, so China's going to war over uh, DX. Well, so what happened was they they took one of these rocks in the sea, having seen, I believe, Bob, and they dumped tons of garbage there and made it much larger. And now there's an airport and a fortress. <laughs> so I always say Bob's the guy who started World War III and now is second vice president of ARL. There you and go. So um, what had happened is I think a year and a half ago, um, the ARL board put in place a director and officer code of conduct. Yeah, it's actually almost exactly a year ago. It was their January board meeting last year. Yeah, and... And I don't know what or who, it's probably who prompted this, um, but maybe one director was a little more outspoken than they liked. And so they put up this policy that essentially says ARL directors among themselves in the board meetings can oppose whatever they want, but they want ARL directors to Face us, the membership, and the world as a block. Okay, so if you don't like something, you support the board in its decision when you're in front of the membership. And I didn't like this. You know, I'd like it to be a little more democratic, where it might be that we have a director who says, you know, I have to support the board and the ARL now, but I voted against this, and this is why I think it's wrong. This is what I'd like to hear from my director, especially before I re-elect them. So um, we weren't getting that from ARL, and um, as it happened, our Southwestern Division Director, Richard Norton, was rather steamed about it and I believe at the Southwestern Division Conference talked about this decision and was subsequently censured by ARRL for talking about the policy that you weren't ta- supposed to talk about the policy. Yep, it was at the uh, Visalia <laughs> International DX Conference. Oh, okay, so it wasn't at the, the HamCon. No, and he might have done it there too. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's a good guy. I've met him and talked with him before, and all directors count him as a friend when I speak with them. Um, but he's probably a little more emotionally in my corner, which is I'm kind of a hothead. And I think he was enough of a hothead to bring this up where people could hear about it, and then he took the fall. Okay, so Richard took the fall to tell us about this policy being a problem. Yeah. And people who were there said that, that he didn't, he, was, he actually didn't say that much, if anything, in opposition to it. He just stated the facts, and other people got upset about it and talked about being upset about it. And yeah. So apparently the ARL heard from someone else a different story than that, but they can't tell us who, and they can't tell us what. Okay. So, I get annoyed, a number of other people in the ham radio get annoyed, write about it, try to publicize the issue. And I happen to run in to Bob Valio and Jim Teamstra at the airport on their way to the meeting. So, bent so there... This, this year's board this, meeting? This very recent board meeting yeah. in January. And um, so I bent their ear about it, but I think they'd already heard about it and <laughs> oh, yeah, including sure. you know Bob had emails from me and um, had had figured out what they were going to do so we had some interesting things first of all um, our our um, director our replacement for the director who was there for 50 years um, only lasted two years and retired and if you ask why it's cause of tax break but it happened to be... Oh, the CEO. CEO, yeah. Yeah, yeah Tom Gallagher. Yeah, so Tom is out. And that's that's a, a different take on uh, spending more time with a family, I think. Yeah. Yeah, taxes. That's it, taxes. Yeah, that sounds okay. good these, days, these years. But, you know, Dave Sumner was there for 50 years in the same office, and he was introduced as Dave's replacement. Yeah. Um, yeah I don't think anybody expected him to go that fast. 
Yes. So, you know, no one, no one knows all the politics, and it, it doesn't really matter. Well, in the, in the vacuum that, that it exists when no one's telling us what's going on, we can speculate as much as we want. And my speculation is, I don't need this crap. Yeah. And this, is, this is schoolyard nonsense, and I don't need to play in this game. Okay. So, and, I, and I have absolutely nothing to back up saying that. So, okay. So, um, there are directors at this meeting uh, now in January, and they, first of all, had found out that part of the policy was against the laws of. They're in Pennsylvania, isn't that? Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut. Connecticut, right. So, um, they had a rule that you weren't to announce the result of votes before the board officially announced them. Apparently, that doesn't work with Connecticut law. <laughs> so they struck that one. And, you know, it took a row about the whole policy before anyone bothered to tell them they were violating the law. And then the Section 8 is the one that says you have to be part of the block. You can't oppose the board's decision publicly. They suspend the entirety of Section 8. Okay, so they have now suspended the rule that they just used to publicly censure Richard Norton. Okay, all of the ARL directors vote to suspend this rule except that Norton abstains. <laughs> okay. Conflict of interest. No public apology to the guy who they have just used this rule and, on. And, and particularly they did not reverse the censure. Yeah. And the censure is something that they can bring up when it is time for him to run again and disqualify him from running for that office again. It's hard to boot him out, but it's fairly easy to keep them from running again if you want to, if, if that's what you want to do. It just takes a little longer. So yeah. they say, well, yeah, he, uh, he was censured by the board, so obviously he doesn't meet our standards for being on the board, so he doesn't get to run again. So let's see what happens. But uh, I think, you know, maybe when the election comes up, he can say thanks, but no thanks to you. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I, I don't think his seat is open this year. There's five five seats open every year. And, and uh, I, I, I get the, the feeling that, that they are scrambling at least in, from PR and maybe some reality um, to make things look a little bit better. Now, ARL board elections have always been um, low-profile snooze fests in most cases. Nobody cares. Nobody pays any attention. Um, nobody pays attention to what goes on in the board meetings. A, a, a very small, limited set of people do, and suddenly everybody's paying attention. They're probably going, why are they paying attention now? Well, it's because you did something really bad. Yeah, you're a representative organization, and, and we want transparency. Yeah. So, yeah, let's have it. So I have been bending the ears of every director and the president, etc. who are in the next building here. Um, is Rod Roderick here? I didn't see him. Yeah, Roderick is here. Okay. And, and, you know, Roderick also wrote an editorial which appeared on the ARL website only days before the meeting where he said, you know, people are upset about this rule, but... We think they're all mistaken, and this, this is things that all sorts of nonprofit organizations do. And it felt to me very unresponsive. And then yeah. only days after he does this, the directors fly in and vote out uh, Section 8. They voted to suspend it. Um, so I kind of thought that Roderick was being unresponsive and he should really man up and say, hey, look here, your directors listen to you and we're sorry. Yeah, tone, but, tone deaf. But we're not going to get we're sorry, apparently. And so, and you know, I, I feel we should get we're sorry and, and Richard Norton should get we're sorry. Um, so here we go. We have until August when they're going to present the reviewed version of the Code of Conduct. Okay. That's, also, that's also when the elections are for five directors. Uh -huh. Nominations starting in June, and then the ballots go out in August. So it's like, uh, 
all going to happen at once. Is any still is anybody going to be paying attention to what's happening at that point? So I can't run. I am involved in a business way in amateur. Radio. You have a conflict of interest. Yeah. So, um, but I would like to see people run. Yeah. I'd like to that's, see turnover. That's the other thing. Mm-hmm. Is is it? It's not like we are. Uh, <clears throat> beating off potential candidates with sticks because there's too many of them. It's, it's rare to find someone who has both the interest and the qualifications. Well, and, and being an ARL director or vice director is a lot of work. I mean, yeah. there are hands on the phone and your email and you are dealing with them every evening and you're yep. doing your work or, you know, if you're lucky, you're retired, but not many retired people have the energy necessary for that job yeah. and um, so um, and and they're flying reasonably often I mean they don't have their meetings on video conference yet those guys go and publicly uh, I'm sorry not publicly but they have their meetings physically in, in each other's proximity yeah, and uh, it's probably because they haven't settled on a good open source video conferencing system. <laughs> well, I've also had to go through with attorneys, you know, whether I can actually have my annual board meeting the electronic conference. So they're probably on the conservative side of that issue. Um, so we really need to talk with our directors now and say... We don't want ARL directors' votings block. We feel that the Section 8 of the Director and Officer Code of Conduct should stay suspended in whatever new version the directors cook up at their August review. Yeah, The, the Code of Conduct, the, that language was actually salted throughout the Code of Conduct. Little, little phrases appearing all over the place that say essentially the same thing that, mm-hmm. that you can debate all you want at the meeting you can't talk about what happened at the meeting you know that's the first rule of fight club and and you can't uh, tell if the vote hasn't been officially recorded if it was a voice vote you can't tell how you voted much less how anyone else voted so um, yeah it, how, how can it, it puts a director who is going to to have opposition for re-election at a big disadvantage, and I'm surprised they didn't really think about this, um, because the opponent can sling all kinds of mud, and the director can't respond. He can't say, "Well, that's not what we did." All he can do is say, "This is, you know, here's the, here was the vote." You know, he can't talk about why or how. It's, it's um, what I was getting from from things that that Roderick and Gallagher were were saying was that. Uh, they, they, they have these corporate attorneys that they were listening to, and they were saying, you know, you, you, have, you have your fiduciary responsibility, and everybody does their codes of conduct this way, and the ARL didn't have one for a long time, and so they're just kind of playing catch-up. So there but, are lawyers, and there are good <laughs> lawyers, yeah. and it's, it's easy to get the first kind and not the second. Well, it sounded like to me like they were being super conservative, but it also sounded like they were trying to put a code of conduct in that didn't fit the ARL because we are a very representative organization and there are some others I've gone looking for examples of codes of conduct that were designed for things like ARLs and they were hard to find I didn't find anything that was really good the, the, the thing as we get to the conspiracy theory point of, of things is did they just screw up or did they have a really good reason for not wanting us to know what's going on yeah, we still don't uh, know what that I'm, is. I'm inclined to say stupidity rather than intent. Uh, that nobody understood all of the implications of having that kind of policy. Uh, they thought that it would reduce political pressure on the directors, would would make things work smoothly for ARL. And, and you know, I... I think ARL needs a big kick in the butt. <laughs> um, 
And obviously I've thought that since before we got rid of the whole Morse code requirement. And we still Which is have, all your fault, by the way. Well, it's, it's, if anybody out there wonders why we don't have Morse code anymore, why it's illegal to operate Morse code. Now. No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> it's illegal to operate Morse code, and it's this guy's fault. And here's his title. Send no, an email. It, it's, uh, there's more people using Morse code today than there were before when there was a Morse code requirement on the amateur idea. And test. having more fun. And Yeah, so we won. Everybody won. Yeah. And... So that was really cool, and uh, here we are again. We still have ARL's rather uh, old, sort of uh, racially uniform, economically uniform membership, and we have this big problem because we got more hams, obviously, when we got rid of that Morse code requirement. And amateur radio was growing, and the sun was shining, and everything was beautiful, and then it stopped growing. More and or less. Amateur radio is not growing. And so our directors looked up and said, Oh, we have a problem here. You know, we thought that we had bypassed this end of amateur radio that we all saw coming before we got rid of the code. And and now again, we're not growing, and that probably means soon we'll be shrinking. And so we have to attract more people into amateur radio. And people who don't look like us, and people who aren't <laughs> old white men like us. Yep. And um, In theory, following you up here on the show, there'll be uh, two women are doing a, uh, a talk right now on, on YLs, and getting more women and having fun with ham radio if you're, if you're female. Yeah, which so is, which all is kinds of diversity. Not just ham radio, but all of, all of tech. All of tech. But, that. you know, there are, there are more people working at desks in Silicon Valley by percentage than there are in active amateur radio. So we, we do have a problem here that I think we have to a greater extent than all of tech. And we do have to work on it. Um, Somebody has to think about the future of amateur radio, and, and unfortunately, I think I still have a job. And <laughs> so you can't do it all. Yeah. But, but, but you uh, can make a loud noise. Yeah, and, and we'll try to push on that issue now. How are we going to get more members? How are we going to get more young people? Uh, and the fact that when we got rid of code requirements, amateur radio grew in the United States actually did not grow at all in most countries. Hmm. So we've got a bunch of things to look at. Well, I, I'm always running into people who got into ham radio either because they learned there was no Morse code or, or because code was a block and they were never going to get in until it was gone. And all valuable, productive, participating and, and uh, um, you know, pe people that are you know, they're, they're building things or running clubs or businesses and stuff in there. It was, I, have, I haven't run into the end of amateur radio type people everybody feared, so that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, there was one person who asked me to let amateur radio die with dignity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and no, no thanks. So, and then the, the final topic is I got sued for $3 million. Oh, cool. Yeah, really. So... Um, How's that feel? I... Uh, it wasn't good, but now it's kind of feeling much better. Is it I'll over or still why. going on? It's it's not quite over, but like the crying on the other side has started. Ah. And so uh, I said that somebody violated or could have violated the GPL. And the GPL is an open source license. And... Um, that company that, that lets somebody use open source software but puts some restrictions on what they can do with it, right? Yeah, that's correct. And um, that company decided that uh, that was libelous of me to say it. It was defamation. It was four or five other things uh, that, that are like defamation. So I got sued for $3 million and um, in California and a number of other states, we have what's called anti-slap. 
and SLAP means a strategic lawsuit against public participation. And so if you sue somebody with the intent of shutting them up, which I'm sure there are lots of people who'd like to do that to me, um, if you're violating their First Amendment rights, they get to bill you for their legal fees. And so what has happened at this point is in the lower court, I have had my anti-slap motion, uh, which the judge agreed with, and we have just filed to bill the other side for my legal fees, and that was $670,000. <laughs> you got expensive lawyers. Yeah, well, they're good lawyers. And you can actually read about this on parents.com. I have a public statement that's approved by my attorneys. And uh, so uh, the other side is appealing. You know, personally, I don't think they'll get very far, but that's obviously up to the judge, not me. And uh, so it'll go a little farther. But what I wanted to happen here was... People should know that if you sue people to shut them up, you can lose big. <laughs> and so we think that's what's happening to the other side now, and, and we'll see what the uh, appeals court has to say. So good luck. Thank you very much. So there's one more thing going on. There's, there's this uh, um, FCC uh, rulemaking petition out there about... Um, I guess it's been out for a long time about... So, uh, so you mean the Technical Advisory Board? Uh, no, I'm talking about the bandwidth thing, uh, where the ARRL is trying to get um, enough bandwidth for Pactor 4, which is probably not something you really like because it's closed. Well... But but the bandwidth would, would be nice. People have actually said that they're trying to bring back regulation by bandwidth. Yeah, Which I'm okay. pretty sure that you would love to have. So, um, ARL in conjunction with operation in Puerto Rico, said that they would, uh, I, I don't know if ARL publicly said that they'd like to have this permanently. What they did was they got a special temporary authorization uh, so that they could use Pactor 4 in Puerto Rico during the emergency. But as it happened, nobody in Puerto Rico, including the team of 50 hams who came down there, actually had a Pactor 4 hardware modem. So Pactor 4 was not used. Um, and now the FCC is asking, well, what could we do to make it easier to help people in disasters like the one in Puerto Rico? And so a couple of people said, well, you could let us use Pactor 4 bandwidth on the air. Um, and, you know, as far as the bandwidth is concerned, um, I don't really have a problem with it. I think a lot of phone guys are going to have a problem with it because they're afraid of digital modes encroaching on their band. And... Um, <laughs> Of, of them being squeezed out. And as it happens, when we run free DV on the air, um, we see phone guys QSYing on top of us. And by the way, uh, don't do that because we're going to report you eventually. And we're going to do it with lots of technological background. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, people and, and do. And you don't need two and a half kilohertz for free DV. No, we don't. It, I think sometimes they don't realize that we can go on talking under them. Um, but anyway, because um, with a flex radio, you can record the whole band. And so we can actually record and play back these guys on a nearby frequency saying, let's QSY over here and then QSY directly on top of us. Um, so anyway... Um, people deserve to operate the way that they want if they're phone guys, if they're AM guys. You know, the AM guys want a, a wider bandwidth to you. Um, and, and maybe the Pactor guys should be able to operate in some situations. Although, what we're really talking about with Pactor is an old-fashioned hardware modem 
where they can't just turn a knob and say, I'll make it slower and narrower than the way we would with a modern software mode. So that's going to be in my reply comment, is, is that, you know, we're, we can't make this rule around obsolete hardware rather than today's technology. Um, but you were, you were a supporter of a regulation by bandwidth back when that was a proposal, I don't know, 15 years ago? Yeah, well, Bonnie, I forgot her last name, uh, first made that 15 years ago. And, and that was an interesting point in ARL's history. That is the first petition for rulemaking made by ARL that they withdrew <laughs> under pressure of their own membership. Yeah, and I think and the issue then and still is CW operators who don't like automated digital stations roaming the band. So That's one thing. Um, I, I mean, there's, I, I think there are a lot of uh, older mode operators who are now getting into digital because of WSJT and that are now more open to digital than they were previously, especially because they can achieve DX that they never could achieve otherwise, even using CW and especially using phone. Uh, so I think that we'll see attitudes change. But what I have proposed a number of times and what I'll probably propose again is that we go with rules that are very similar to the rules that are currently being used by the rebel nation of Canada. <laughs> okay, what, home what they of do? the evil regulation by bandwidth, which apparently they implemented tw 10 or 20 years ago without our noticing. Yeah. And, um, and you know, nobody's saying we have all this harmful interference from Canada. That's because there's only like 20 or 30 Canadian hams. <laughs> but do, do you know the details of what they implemented? Oh, yes. It's on their website. Well, they're, not, they're not hiding it, but I'm just wondering if we can tell people because I don't know what they are. Well, I, I mean, the main thing is, is the general bandwidth that you would get on most of our phone bands is about five kilohertz. And I, somewhat naively, thought, well, that's going to be fine. The SSB guys will all fit in that with no trouble at all. And then I started getting emails from the AM folks. The AM folks said, hey, are you trying to illegalize us? And the correct answer to that is, I have no good reason to. So the next time that I submit that, maybe it will include a section on allowing legacy modes to continue. Okay, where a legacy mode is AM radio telephone, we have no reason to make it illegal, even if we say you can do anything you want within five kilohertz. Maybe you can do these specific modulation designators within specific bandwidths. So whatever is necessary for yeah. AM phone. Uh, carving out an exemption, I can certainly see that as uh, you know, a legacy thing. The idea of then attaching designators to different different uh, modes and, and regulations, I thought that was the whole idea for getting, getting rid of all that by saying whatever you want to do, if you can do it in 5 kilohertz, you get this part of the band. If you can do it in, I don't know, 1, 1 1.5 kilohertz, you can do it over here. And if you could do it in at 500 hertz, you can do it down there. Whatever you want to put in there. And it, yeah, you know, it's all that, fine. That's absolutely right. And in a perfect world, that is all I would say. But if it takes putting in this little carve out for AM to totally remove the opposition of all the AM guys, well, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. And AM would be almost the only exemption we would have to worry about except for one thing. D Star and all those HF radios is six and a quarter kilohertz wide. Is yeah, D Star know, a legacy mode? Oh no, because it's never been authorized. So, but so it's used all the time. It, not on HF. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, yeah. It's it's. I don't think it's actually legal on HF. Yeah, it's in it's in the uh, ninety one hundred. It's in the. Um, it's not in my seven thousand, but it's in the seventy one hundred. Oh, so Several, you th so there, there are people actually using it on HF yeah. when IMO, they are not allowed to. Well, I, I don't know that they're not allowed to. I mean, I'm not sure what it is that they're not allowed to do with D-Star on HF. Well, if you look at what are the permitted 
digital modes, they're all based on ASCII. And um, you can make a reasonably good argument that there's nothing but text permitted under digital operations currently. Um, so will that be a problem for FreeDV too? Uh, I think it's less of a problem on VHF than on HF. Well, FreeDV is FreeDV is the HF. Oh, I'm sorry. Would it be a problem for FreeDV on phone? Um, okay, there's this other thing with rulemaking that drives me crazy is uh, are these radio telephone or are they digital modes? <laughs> yeah, and they and is it a breath mint or is it a candy mint? It's two okay. in one. So, so I have had people who are involved in regulation tell me it's not a digital mode, it's radio telephone. And thus, the rules for radio telephone apply and none of the rules for digital apply whatsoever. And that's what is so much fun about Part 97. It is so tangled and vague. Yep. that you can make a case for or against anything. But we finally have a word to describe exactly what that is. It's an alternative fact. Okay, we weren't going to talk about politics. <laughs> so um, I, don't, I don't know how that slipped in. Is that by accident? Yeah, I, I don't know. The people who believe in those, they, they can come to the Village Idiots National Conference <laughs> and assert themselves. Yep. We beat them up, you know. And um, <laughs> so... Um, well, that's been enough topics, hasn't it? I think I think we've covered just about all of it. You going to the uh, Tapper Conference is going to be in Albuquerque this year. Yeah, I guess I'll go to Albuquerque and uh, talk about stuff I'm doing on the radio by yeah. then. Your next public uh, surfacing will be at the uh, Dayton. Well, it's Shiloh now. It's the Shiloh Ham. <laughs> Uh, Xenia. Xenia, that's Day correct. Yeah, Dayton Xenia. Okay. It, was, it was Shiloh. Well, no, was that, Shiloh well, was the street. It was actually Trotwood. Trotwood was the town. Okay. Yeah. The Trotwood but Ham Fest. The nobody famous, the ever world knew famous that. Trotwood Ham Fest. Yeah. So, which is now the world famous Xenia Ham Fest. And, and apparently, I saw this video of people who broke into Hara. Yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> Ur urban, uh, what, do they, what do they call themselves? Urban archaeologists. Yeah. And, uh, ooh, In other boy. words, squatters and, and uh, thugs. Well, <laughs> no, I th I mean, these guys, they just took cameras and, you know, yeah. and they... I, uh, I don't think they took anything. No. Well, it, who would care? Yeah. It was all trash. Yeah. But uh, it, it's sad to see it going. And I, I guess the last year or two when I was there and the... Harrah Golf Course had closed and all grass was growing up. It, it was pretty obvious where things were going. And uh, they had gotten that company to rebuild Harrah and they showed this great picture of Harrah with new paint and stars on the walls. Yes, I saw. I got a picture of that. <laughs> so uh, you heard the uh, the song they did at the uh, at the contester's dinner, Don't Cry for Harrah Arena. Oh, that's to, funny. To the tune of Don't Cry for Me, Argentina. Right. So I won't try to sing it here, but uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. Okay. So we, we remember you fondly, Hera Arena. Goodbye. Farewell. But we, we have another uh, mud parking lot this year, apparently. And the new hall, which they were going to build, um, will not be built in time. Right. Yeah. They get the, uh, the fairgrounds furniture folks are out of their building. But it's not a really big building, so it's going to help some, but uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, Jason Johnston uh, was at the forum here at Orlando put on by the, the Dayton folks talking about what they're, what they're planning on doing. One of the things that they said that they were planning on doing um, about the parking lot was just not letting driving in and out nearly so much. So you drive in, you park, you're there for the day, then you can drive out. Apparently, I know it didn't spend a lot of time out there, but apparently people could drive in and out at will, and that volume of traffic is what really did it in. So maybe that will I help. don't know. Where would you go in Xenia? <laughs> Xenia is a, it's a very picturesque town full of the antique shops and stuff. It's, oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's a destination. They're, I mean, there's the Air Force Museum, but yeah. I, I didn't... 
you know, there's not like fast food places right there or something for lunch. So. And who would want to go to them because the fair food was so good compared to fast food? Oh, I, I wasn't there, but I'm sure I can imagine. Uh, well, it's but like they got eighteen thousand people here. Yeah, it's like it's like what they have here. Only there's more of it because we this here at this Amfest is also basically county fair food trucks mm-hmm. and kind of the same thing it's at uh, at Dayton, but to, but more selection, more of them, and they were pretty good. Yeah, but you know they got eighteen thousand here, and and what did we get twenty three thousand? Their uh, announced number was twenty nine thousand. All right, so, so that's which, still a reasonable. Yeah, and there, and a big bump from what they had. In a few years in the past, which is and it, it, it's skeptic making. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't want to say that, that someone paid for the tickets. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that they were um, doing an alternative fact. Um, I don't know how audited that is. Hamfest attendance figures are notoriously inflated at many venues, and and they're not audited at all. And okay. when I announced real numbers for a Hamfest that I was involved in, everyone went. <gasps> Really? <laughs> Just that? So, um, but that's, you know, those are real numbers. And, and we wanted to make it sound better. The, uh, the you know, you have the drive to, to inflate the numbers is strong and seems to happen a lot. I don't know how audited um, Dayton's numbers are now or not. All right. So, if, if they got, if they really got 29,000, excellent. That is mm-hmm. great. That is healthy for ham rating. Mm-hmm. Most other ham fests are struggling just to get by. Okay. All right, but you're going to be there, and you're going to have prototype, prototypical hardware to show. That's correct, and so we'll have some fun. We have, uh, um, we can share the same frequency with multiple radios because it's digital, and they can do time slots. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you had, um, you had mentioned. Uh, at the uh, the last talk at Dayton, um, the radio being made by Wireless Holdings, their multi-band, multi-digital mode radio, that is still yet to come out. So you think they're probably feeling the same kind of pain of uh, engineering? So, so I think there's some guy who's sort of related to them selling boards here, and uh, I have yet to figure out the association. Um, They'll probably come out. Um, the the question is, have they run into the same sort of issues? Yeah. Chris and I and others have. But I had seen that their software worked for the dongle radio, uh, which they had previously come out with, and that they could do a number of digital modes. Um, and I, I wasn't sure if they used software AMB or if they used chip AMB what they were doing for that. Um, you know, I'd rather just not use Ambi, but there are a number of people who'd like to do it in software, and the patents are expired now. Okay. So Am- Ambi's early versions, anybody can use them now? Yeah, Ambi if 1000 anybody is the one that was used <laughs> in D-Star. Actually any good? Um, I like Codec 2 better. Well, yeah. <laughs> And uh, one of the criticisms I have of Ambi is that it has fake bass, you know, because people think that it's high fidelity if it has loud thumping bass. So they put fake bass in there, and it doesn't help your communication at all. Um, and then the next thing is the older style Ambi, although we can fix this in software, had those squeals, which I know your wife hated, etc. Yeah, I hate them. Yeah. And... Um, so, we never have a squeal on free TV. We have other kinds of noises. Well, it, it, it is an interesting uh, thing because everyone has, had, had said digital is either there or not. And free TV is designed to be uh, degradable. Yeah, it, it free turn, TV. It turns, turns the digital cliff on its head. It, it actually, if your signal really fades... Sounds like the operator's mumbling yeah. instead of sounds like the operator's not there at all. Uh, and so that is interesting. And there's actually a kind of redundancy coding that you do to make digital perfect. 
And the problem is that when you get fading, that redundancy coding actually contributes to failure too. That it gives you that all or nothing problem. And if we just, instead of having a lot of redundancy coding, we just double up on the bits that are really important. And uh, no really sophisticated math, we just transmit them twice. And that means that when you fade, you don't get other bits, but you get those bits. So you can probably still understand what's being said. Yeah. And so that's really cool. Dave Rowe is still working on it. Um, he'd been working for a while on a 700 bit per second mode. So that can beat SSB. We're, we're to the point where we can actually beat SSB. Beat it in terms of signal to noise. And well, signals going in, in, in terms of having signal. a voice you can understand at very low signal to noise. Yeah. Uh, where SSB would have a lot of noise in it. And here you have a maybe not tremendously clear digital signal with no noise. Now, it just occurred to me to ask, when you're talking about SSB at, in, at that level, SSB without speech compression will disappear fast. SSB with good speech compression and, and proper bandwidth shaping and all that stuff can work in, in, in much weaker signal levels that just hams don't know how. So which are you comparing to? Which SSB are you... Uh, that, that's a good point, and I should, should do a more scientific test on that basis. Yeah. Is, you know, get, get Heil and compare to him or something. <laughs> I don't think he'd cooperate. Um, and so uh, Dave now, I believe, is working on a higher fidelity mode. And that's interesting because maybe we'll have a narrower bandwidth solution for the AM guys. Okay. And um, so that keeps going on. Uh, Brady. Hey, AM guys won't care. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, you, you, they've, they have to get new needles for their phonographs. <laughs> and so um, Brady has been working on some new digital modems and, and on uh, sharing one frequency among multiple radios. And, and that's cool because you can also have a repeater that only uses one frequency and doesn't have those big cans that they use to discriminate between the input and the output. That may be the thing that I'm looking forward to the most is that uh, on, on frequency time shared repeater. Because mm -hmm. that, 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 would, that would literally allow everybody to have a repeater in their backyard and have enough spectrum. Which is it. not necessarily a good thing. Well... <laughs> Everybody who wants one. If, you know, if we trunk gonna... them all together, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's let's figure out how to do that and without the internet so that it keeps working when we actually need it. All right, so it's a decade since I produced my program called Digital Voice for Amateur Radio. I fortunately did not predict that digital would take over within, that, within the next 10 years because now here we are 10 years out. And it has not. Has it... Has it gotten any kind of a foothold besides the VHS? Well, I mean, VHS if you stuff? include stuff like WSJT. No, digital voice. Digital voice. Yeah. Um, now, now, VHF, UHF, yeah. The, uh, the triumvirate of uh, D-Star, DMR, and C4FM, and a little bit of P25. There is There's an impressive amount of DMR at the show. And the, the, I'm a little disquieted because DMR isn't the best we can do. But DMR has really good routing. Yeah, you've got your own. Yep, I got the uh, the MD380. What was that? Fifty dollars? Well, when I bought it, it was a hundred. It may be down to fifty bucks now. Okay. And I think that is a, a good fifty percent of the reason why DMR is so popular. Is because you can get these cheap radios. Yeah. And and now, and they don't have any of the R2D2 bobble. Yeah, and, and it doesn't come from just one manufacturer. Right. So and all they needed was a standard. Yep, and with a Brandmeister coming out as a network that you can hook your repeater up to and make it as flexible as D-Star and as user-controllable as D-Star, the disadvantages of DMR have fallen by the wayside thanks to amateur ingenuity. Yeah, so, you know, here I am. That's this DMR is, also. This is also DMR radio. Um, the, the Runbo is the <laughs> Chinese company. It kind of like run and Rambo all smushed together and uh, 
and it's being sold by our finder with their own improvement in the software um so yeah i could run dmr on that and maybe they'll let me talk with them yeah uh, how open source is dmr uh, I believe that you can implement the standard in open source, but I have not rigorously verified that. And everybody is using the Ambi vocoder. Yeah, and I, I have not verified what version and whether all the patents on the version being used have expired. Um, but, you know, I'm definitely for open standards wherever we can get them. And, they have this nasty thing that they can do, which is they allow patent royalties with reasonable and non-discriminatory terms, which, where we're concerned, they are neither reasonable nor non-discriminatory. <laughs> All right. So, my ladies are here in the background behind you. It's time to do the next show. Thank you, Bruce. Well, we need YLs and amateur radio, so do. I'm going to get out of the way. So, you are Bruce Perrins, K6BP. And uh, I am, can I do this one? There we go. Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, Ham Radio Now is brought to you by you if you enjoy the programs. Free to watch, uh, not free to make. HamRadioNow.tv. Thanks for watching. Over and out.